don't say you did nothing of the sort. And I say you swab it again and you swab it proper like this time and you'll be swabbing it ten times more after that. And if I tells you to pull up and apart every floorboard and clapboard of this here house and scour them down with your bare bleeding knuckles, you'll do it. And if I tells you to yank out every single nail from every molding nail hole and suck off every speck of rust till all them nails sparkle like a sperm whale's <laughs> and then carpenter the whole light station back together from scrap and then do it all over again, you'll do it! And by God and by golly, you'll do it, smiling lad, cos you like it! You like it cos I says you will! Hello, Willem, how are you? I am well, thanks. Thank you very much indeed for your My time. My pleasure. Sure, sure. Um, but you're you're not really the guy in the movie who had the most fantastic beard, and he also broke wind uh, an awful lot. So I'm I'm hoping that it's Willem Dafoe and not the crusty, flatulent <laughs> lighthouse keeper uh, in this movie. Uh, you got both of them here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told. I know. Look, this is a this is a very very minor point. But I assumed that the wind was added on. I, I'm talking about flatulence here. Uh, it was added on afterwards. And then someone told me that actually that wasn't added on afterwards and that actually you contributed that at the time. So this is a minor point in the telling of this story. But what's the it's truth? It's such a minor point, I don't recall the truth. I will tell you, though, that uh, the flatulence was actually uh, written into the script. I kind of imagine it was a Foley artist who was getting excited. <laughs> this wasn't like done in post. I mean, it was part of the scene. Okay, all right. It was an important part of the struggle it for, is. for uh, dominance. Exactly. So paint the picture, Willem, in this, in this lighthouse. Well, the director always says this movie is about nothing good can happen when two men are trapped in a giant phallus. Ain't that the truth? And... Uh, that gives you a little bit of the taste of it, maybe the wrong taste. <laughs> but um, two guys, one old, mysteriously played by myself, and uh, Rob Pattinson, young, uh, come to uh, do their, their duty at Lighthouse. I'm the normal keeper. He's like an apprentice. He's a new guy. And we're going to be there for four weeks, and then we're going to get relieved. But the weather goes bad. And they can't relieve us. And soon the weather goes very badly. And then uh, our food uh, gets spoiled. And then we have nothing but liquor left. And uh, we start to drink and things go very bad. That is true. That's the simple there story. And it, but it's actually quite a simple story. It is a simple story. It is very it's two simple. guys in a lighthouse. Right. Where but, things go bad. Yes. But uh, it's... Quite complicated in, uh, yeah. Tell us, so your guy, the old timer, Tom. Right. He's, he, knows, he knows the drill. He's a he's, sea dog. He's a believer. He's a sea dog. He's, a de he's devoted his life to this job and he believes in it. And he believes there are rules, there are ways to do things and you have to do them elegantly. You have to do them with devotion. And then you have this young guy that comes and he's not quite having it. He's not quite with the program, let's say. And uh, so that's the initial struggle. And then as things go bad, it, it really, you see the, you know, their identities get stripped away and you kind of see what's left after you strip mm. away someone's identity. But there's a def, even though there's just two of you, there's a pecking order very much, isn't yeah, there? And you're, definitely. and you're in charge. Yeah, yeah, for a while. <laughs> yes, and uh, because Robert Pattinson, who plays Ephraim Winslow, who's the other guy, mm -hmm. he to start with, he's very, he's very kind of deferential and and quiet, right? And he's just kind of feeling his way around. It's true. It's true. The atmosphere in the lighthouse is obviously claustrophobic, is obviously smelly mm -hmm. uh, and uh, noisy. Uh, and as the weather turns, we kind of feel as though we're in this lighthouse with you and we all are desperate to get off the island. And that's the, <laughs> okay. you know, you, you're staying with the film, you're enjoying the film, but you want to get off the island. <laughs> yes. But there's something about, you know, that setup and the way you've described it. When There's a there's a moment early on where you you and Robert Pattinson arrive, this is right in the first two minutes of the, mm -hmm. the movie, and you, <clears throat> you relieve two other people who aren't credited. I look for their names because they don't really have much of a part. Anyway, but you relieve them as they go off and you just think... This is not going to go well. Oh, do you now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the t 
tell us, you mentioned that the director says nothing good happens when two men live in a giant phallus or whatever it was. He, so this is Robert Eggers. Tell us about why... Uh, Robert Eggers, his first film was The Witch. Um, and I don't know how the release went here, but it was quite uh, well received in the States. I saw it without knowing anything about it. And I was so taken with it that I really tracked him down. Uh, had a meeting with him, got to know him, and we made a pledge that we'd work together. What was it about The Witch that made you think? Um, you know, it's hard to remember exactly. I mean, it's something about, it's a, it, that was a period movie, and uh, as this is. And it was so, uh, it was exotic, but it was so easy to enter. And also the way he dealt with the performers, you couldn't tell whether they were professionals, found people, you know. Uh, he mixed children with uh, obviously professional actors. He mi mixed animals with the children. It it all, he, he created a world that you never fell out of and you were there deeply. Uh, and that's a talent, particularly with the period film when uh, period films tend to point to themselves all the time mm. to remind you where you are. And there was no need for that, there's a there's a level of detail and 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 beauty uh, that you seldom see in films. And I think he, you know, that was the attraction. And I think he also achieved that in this film because the world is so complete and so detailed and so authentic. Mm. See, so if it's interesting, if, if if we were to say we've got to Willem Dafoe on the program and he's yeah. talking about his new movie, I don't think anyone would know what that movie was going to be like because you're in such an astonishing variety of movies that it's interesting to hear your process almost in terms of how you decide what you're going to be in, that you found this guy, you liked the cut of his jib and you thought, yeah. I want to be in something that he does. I wanted to help him do what he does. I wanted to do my job in the service of his vision, basically. And that's, that's often nice position to be in, uh, because it frees you from your agenda and gives you a new agenda and you usually learn something and there's a more possibility for transformation. So you give yourself to someone that you really believe in to try to help them do what they do. Um, and uh, that's a pleasure because I think, you know, when you set your own agenda, you kind of know where you're going. And I think sometimes you have to uh, take your... your um, you're calling your uh, the object of that you're you're going towards from someone mm. else, and I think that that allows you to explore in a deeper way. You said it's a pleasure. Was making this film a pleasure? The, re <laughs> the reason I ask is because <laughs> it's, it's the, the, you know it's horrible inside and it's horrible outside. <laughs> <laughs> but such a pleasure. <laughs> Look, I'm not uh, into. I'm not a masochist, and it wasn't pleasant as far as it was uncomfortable. But that's what it's about. It's about uh, you know men in uh, people in uh, remote places uh, interfacing with uh, nature and all of its power and uh, cruelty and beauty. Um, you know, it was difficult, but uh, you know sometimes no acting required in the respect that. Uh, we were just reacting to where we were. We were just doing our tasks in this world that was dominated, in this case, very much by weather. It's a part of the story, and it really conditions how you perform. Yeah, And I, I like that because, uh, let's face it, nature is a pretty uh, uh, powerful acting partner. And it's you mentioned period drama for, for The Witch, and this is a period. I mean, this is period. It's 1890s. Uh, 18, where, and where are Maine. we? the state of Maine, a, a lighthouse off the coast of the state of Maine. And we actually shot it in Nova Scotia uh, at a place very much near the fishing town of Yarmouth, uh, uh, a pen rocky peninsula called Fort, uh, no, Cape Forshu. And uh, we built the lighthouse, a lighthouse that could actually function through its light 17 miles. Now, this is amazing. So you, so the crew built the lighthouse? So the lighthouse I didn't, the personally. Picture. I wish I had because it was a beautiful thing. But yet, no, they, they built it and it withstood gale force winds and, and also the everything you see in the movie was built. And the isolation, which you feel in the picture very much, so this is, and this is a genuine isolation which you have. Somewhat. I mean, the town of Yarmouth is is quite close but for example I uh, when I wasn't that set I was living at a fisherman's cottage quite close to set 
And the reality of living that way was I was out in the elements as well. I mean, it was close to a road. It wasn't so, so remote. But first thing I'd do when I'd wake up is I'd uh, make a fire to get warm and uh, look at to see what the sky was doing because that was going to tell me what we were going to do that day. Wow. Have you ever worked like that before where, you know, where you're – you're a long way away from the big city. Obviously, that's a fairly straightforward thing. But to be right. living in a fisherman's cottage next to a lighthouse that you're going to be in. Um, yeah, uh, it's pretty particular. Uh, you know, uh, for example, once I shot a film in Tasmania and we were in quite remote area mm. and, and we were in nature a lot of the time. So it's not totally unique, but it was very specific. I want to talk about the seagulls. Okay. <laughs> At the end of the movie. Yeah. There, it, it comes up on the as the credits are rolling. There's a seagull unit. Yeah, so I, very I wanna, important. I don't want to give anything away, but can you can you tell us anything about the importance of the seagulls? Well, they're they're important. Uh, <laughs> they bring good and bad news. Um, uh, they're important characters in the story, um, and we had seagull actors. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, I think the original idea... In fact, they were English, as a matter of fact. English seagulls. <laughs> yes. And and they each had their talent. <laughs> one was very good at pecking, one was very good at cawing, and one was very good at uh, uh, scratching. So very very method. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, they they did their work well. Typecast. Yeah. I heard that there was... Originally, the plan was to do puppets, but then... It didn't work out it, so It well. didn't work, so uh, the Harry Potter... Owl trainer was called, and oh, so you know more than I do because, of course, this happened without me. the The culture of the lighthouse, yeah, uh, which you are immersed in, you more than Robert Pattinson. Really, you are you are the the salty dog. Yes, presumably that must have been a great pleasure. I would think you know accents, shanties, the whole culture and look and feel of what this extraordinary place was like. It played on my imagination. It was a world that I wanted to enter. And and you mentioned the, the dialogue. It's 1890s seafaring dialogue. Fruity. And, uh, and in very poetic, very elevated, uh, full of beautiful images, really a pleasure to play with. Uh, it's not uh, our normal... Uh, it's not normal prosaic uh, past the butter language you know it's very elevated and the look of the film is is very striking as well it's it's four by three and it's black and white right and when you sat down and you watched it and you saw it what did you what did you think what was funny is um, you know we didn't have traditional coverage uh at all it was a very designed way of shooting uh, because the conditions were very difficult and they were using period filters and doing all kinds of very experimental and risky things kind of beyond their experience they had to be very well prepared so the shots were quite um designed and there was no looseness in terms of how we were shooting it so there weren't a lot of choices particularly mm. in the cut so that's usually what surprises you surprises you in a movie the pace how things are are uh, you know what kind of uh, takes they used what kind of shots they used that was not so much the case because what we shot is what we used there was little fat and i think there was only one scene and it was quite brief that was cut so basically what we shot was the movie and how would you describe it? it's being mislabeled i think as a horror yeah because not at all no how was so what would you describe it as uh, it's you know, it's a, it's a psychological thriller, but that also doesn't quite describe yeah. it. What's beautiful about it is it's quite unique, I think, and I, I really stand by that. I think it's true. And what helps for people that have, you know, a film, uh, have a film culture, for me, you know, it's a mix of Bergman, Tarkovsky with a little Hitchcock thrown in. Hmm. I don't want to give anything away, but if you cook me lobster, I'd definitely eat it. <laughs> okay. 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 I just, I cook a mean lobster. I just want to make that very clear. And, just, and, and before you go, Willem, I just want to mention uh, Motherless Brooklyn because Ed okay. Norton was on the show a few oh, weeks okay, back, and it, you know, completely his picture, obviously written, yep. produced, directed, uh, and he called you in. Uh, that it looks amazing. The soundtrack is astonishing. What was that experience like working on Motherless Brooklyn? I it was, as you describe it, a passion project of uh, Edwards that he worked on for a very long time. Uh, 
a great cast, uh, a New York story, uh, something that uh, has yeah Edward's fingerprints all over it. Very interesting take on it's invented, it's fictionalized, but a very interesting take that's uh, a riff sort of on uh, the Robert Moses story yeah. about uh, real estate development in New York City and, and city planning. And, and also how racism was kind of baked I, I into was, the planet. Yeah, I was going to get that. Yeah, it's incredible. So it's um, a lot of it's invented, but a lot of it's very familiar. And of course, it also has resonance to what's going on today in terms of um, certain power figures and their relationship to how they sell their ideas to uh, to the people and uh, how uh, what they're people's relationship is to government. Mm. So, I don't know who you're thinking of there. But yeah, anyway, well, let's me just, neither. Let's just leave it, at, <laughs> leave it at the, What do we see you in next, Willem? Um, okay, there's this. Lighthouse comes out uh, January 31st here. Uh, I'm, I did a dog sled movie for Disney called Togo that's on their streaming service, which is a new adventure for me. A dog sled movie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, shot in the uh, Canadian Rockies. Uh, very beautiful picture. Uh, got a cameo in uh, Wes Anderson's movie, uh, uh, D. Reese movie, uh, based on a John Didion novel called uh, The Last Thing He Wanted, <laughs> and uh, preparing some other things. Going to work with Guillermo del Toro, which I'm very excited about, and work with uh, Rob Eggers again on his next project. It's going to be a busy year. <laughs> we hope. Uh, William Defoe. I'd like to work. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you.